Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. Good day and welcome to Be or Not to Be, another edition of Thrush and Treasure, the Torture Turbo Musical Comedy Podcast, which by any other name would sound as sweet, yet with that same old bitter taste. And speaking of bitter, I hardly know her, because I'm Aaron, and I'm joined as usual by the co-host who stole the cookie from the cookie jar. It's Spencer, the Broadway spy. How's it going? Going great, Aaron. I'm excited for today's episode. Yeah. Good. Last week you hosted for the first time. Were you shitting yourself? I actually wasn't. I I, I enjoyed it a lot. You know, definitely was not as confident as I probably could have been. But um, I, I'm really proud of what we did. And it's a really great episode. Confidence will come with time and practice as well. Um, but yeah, no, no, I thought you did really, really well. So tonight I uh, went to a talk back with the cast of parade oh yeah and so it was ben platt michaela diamond alfred yuri and michael arden yeah um it was really interesting it was uh it was at a synagogue so they were really talking about the the judaism and the story yeah it, it was it was really interesting talking about you know ben platt said something where he was like you know what what's interesting about my judaism is it's not the first thing i think of when i think of me he said yeah. when i think of my identity i think of myself as an actor, I think of myself as a queer man. I, I, Jewish is just something that I've always taken for granted until I worked on this show. And I thought that that was really interesting way of saying that. Yeah. Uh, his beard was like very thick, but also he's shaving it once they enter tech because Leo Frank was shaven. So like, I guess he's just like, I'm going to, until I have to shave my beard. That's very common. Anyways, guess what? What? We have an iconic West End diva in the studio today. And this heartwarming baby is here to show us the meaning of being lovely. Truly, especially after trading the tropical treats of Trinidad and Tobago for the triple threats of old London town, this towering treasure has sent tremors through theatres from Totti to Torquay, thus treading Thames, Thames, Thames across the board by easing on down the road for The Wiz. And then, oops, she did it again for Wicked on the West End and this magic streak sent her up rumor jig and conjured up a rag old time and caused a domino effect that I'm confident was this star's teenage dream and indenting an incredible imprint on the industry where she was a cool mum for daddy cool rocked the boat with some guys and dolls before swapping the boat for a taxi for fame on tour but once on this island she said all who people can't you see can't you see how your junk's affecting our environment in the Lorax to which I said what about her in breakfast at Tiffany's, to which again I say, yum, breakfast, but I also say a huge Aussie, g'day Anna, what do you want from me? To this stunningly sensational singer who will cause you all to roar with applause in the Sunshine Boys with Porgy, Bess and the real Ness, not the fake one, and she won't stop the feeling of being Les Miserables, you'll just have to sing blues in the night. And baby, one more time, she'll show you the shape of her heart with Ma Rainey's black bottom. Ooh, so to top it off, please stop me from going ape with excitement as we show her love and welcome to the torture chamber, this super carefree, stagey, mystic, expert at singing notes who's left her magical mark by moulding Mrs. Corrie into Mary Poppins, plus Mrs. Phelps into Matilda, as well as wading in warm waters to workshop Ursula for The Little Mermaid and rocking your body right for kicks. ruh row. Oh, and for Juliet. But since she's been gone from the West End cast, it turns out where for Arthur was Toronto. Now it's Broadway in her NYC debut. So I won't wait another New York minute because I can't feel my face. Luckily, we're joined by the singer, actress, sometimes dancer, who's not a girl, not just a woman. She's the fucking perfect Queen Melanie Love Barry. Welcome to the Torture Chamber. How are you going? <laughs> Goodness me. That is just, Whew. that is just wonderful absolutely wonderful i don't think i've ever had my entire career reeled off at me quite like that that was just that was marvelous well done well done to you <laughs> thank you so much it, it does take a hell of a lot out of a person at what was it now six o'clock in the morning in australia so i've been practicing and practicing and practicing because i don't want to take my time they're already long enough as it is i, I need to fly through that as quickly as possible but I'm, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it look if you guys hadn't have done that all, all your careers that you've had I couldn't do that so thank you well yes yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm ever so glad that I was able to then give you enough material to be able to do that 
<laughs> That's the point. That's why we can only invite icons on the show, Melanie, because I can't do that with someone who's had three things on there. There, I know it sounds awful. It really, really does. <laughs> but I would have to pad. I would have to pad something chronic. But I'm not good at padding, as we learn on this show. I put my foot in it when I try to pad. But anyways, how are you going? I am so well. It's what time? It's two o'clock in the afternoon here. And I haven't looked outside yet because I've been busy just looking, you know, into computer screens and phone screens. But I think it's a little bit grey. I don't know what the weather is doing in January. People were warning me so much when I was coming over from London because London is, is it, it gets cold, but obviously not as cold as New York. And they kept warning me about these New York winters. I am waiting. I think it will come. I think it will come and it will bite me in the ass at the, at the end of the month and maybe in February. But I'm, I'm waiting for it to get um, really, really cold. But it's kind of unseasonably warm at the moment in New York. Yeah, well, you're like, it's been very hot in Melbourne. And actually, we have had so many spiders, speaking of biting on the bum, that is what I am terrified of because I just keep seeing these ones in Melbourne called white tail spiders, which are apparently a mutated spider. I'm not, okay, I have to stop now. If I suddenly <laughs> scream, we know that I have seen a spider in my vicinity, which has happened on this show. It is on record in an episode. I suddenly scream because there's a spider. And then you just hear me go <laughs> like that, bashing it. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to move on. Now, you are now a Broadway star, officially. Did you get extra goosebumpy making your New York City debut? It was incredibly special. Yeah. I remember having an interview with Richie Rich and, you know, the famed arts persona and journalist here. And he reminded me, he spoke to me in Toronto and he said, you must make sure and be present for every moment that happens on your Broadway debut because you only have one. And I know it seems like such a normal thing to say, but sometimes you could get caught up in the whirlwind of making the show and opening and then the audience is like mm -hmm. you know amazing and they love you and um and you could forget to just take a moment and stop and breathe it in and I remember that on my curtain call I, I did exactly what he told me to do and uh took a moment to breathe it all in and it it filled me up with so with so much joy and so much gratitude and I was just I was ever so pleased to be here and I was grateful for everybody who asked me to be here. That was the thing that I think that I thought about the most. I thought about Luke Shepard and Bill Sherman and Max Martin and Dominic Palacaro and Jennifer Weber and David West Reed and all the creatives of Anne Juliet who put their heads together and said, we would like Melanie to be a part of this American production. Um, and and that they were the ones in my head. And, and yeah. I was filled with so much love and joy to just have known them. And to have been with this show since 2017. So to get to Broadway with it yeah. from the very first workshop in the UK, it's like I've done the whole journey now. That's it. And for Broadway equity to allow foreigners or anyone who's not, you know, a Broadway performer to perform on Broadway, you have to have, you have to be iconic in that role. You have to, there's no one else that can play that part but you. Then that's why, you know, they will let, allow certain people in who don't already have equity cards. That's what I'm told. But anyways, we do have more questions about Anne Juliet later in the show, but we're going to move on to metal. Now, do you have any experience with metal, heavy metal, glam metal, thrash, death metal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There is a million. I, I do not, right? I have no experience with that. Now, I will say, I don't know if this will be classed as metal. I don't think so. Um, But when I was in a band in Trinidad and Tobago, we yeah. once opened, we were once the opening act for White Snake when they came yeah. to Trinidad and Tobago. So that was, I think it's like one, I think it's cool, right? <laughs> I don't know anything, but I think I think that I was really cool to just be be able to be a part of that. But I have really no experience with it at all. And I had no idea. And that would have been in your introduction, had I known that, <laughs> that you opened your career opening for White Snake, who is a hair metal band. They are 80s metal. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there, the thing about it is that there is so much, there was a whole career before I even went to the West End. You know, I went to the West End, I was in my 20s, but, but you know, back in Trinidad, I used to be a radio DJ and I, you know, was in a band uh, which opened for TLC and MC Hammer and what? White Snake. And, yeah, so it's like, there's a whole there's a whole thing. <laughs> I did my research. Clearly I did my research and I'm like, hang on a second. TLC, MC Hammer. Like that's my yeah. go-to karaoke song, by the way. Can't touch this, which is the dorkiest thing. I put on a bow tie. I tuck my shirt in. I pull it up. I do it on cruise ships for the 70, 80-year-olds. <laughs> they love it, right? All the younger people think I'm a fucking weirdo. But anyways, um, oh, my God. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. I look like a fool. No. <laughs> no, I do. I put in all that effort, Melody, and I've just missed. And usually I've deliberately left things out because there's just too much. Like you guys, there's way too much to do. We're talking about, you know, the opposite end of not having enough. Sorry to those who don't. Again, but yeah, okay, I'm so sorry. We're going to move on very quickly. What would be in your ultimate most over-the-top rock star rider if you could just put any ridiculous thing on there? Oh, oh gosh, um, I don't know how to be ridiculous. Um, let's see, what would be in my rock star rider? I would, I would like have like um a whole room full of like Muppets and Sesame Street memorabilia because yes. I'm absolutely obsessed with the Muppets and Sesame Street and the, and Jim Henson in particular is like my ultimate hero. Yep. So that's what would be in my rider. I would have to be surrounded by that sort of stuff. Wow, that is wonderful. And a shout out to Kirk Thatcher, who is a Muppets director, friend of the show, who was on in 2021. You've got to listen to this episode. That is amazing. Yes, Muppets all the way. But anyways, we'll move on. Now, the metal album this week, I chose Corn. I don't remember having Corn. So Spencer, I'm going to let you go first because you reviewed it this week. Yeah. Can I just say I had never listened to Corn before. I'd heard of them. I don't know why I had heard of them. It was one of those, like, I know the name, but I don't know why. Um, but, like, that first, when you start this record, uh, the first song is called It's On. And that's how I felt. Like, I was like, oh, shit, this is happening. Like, that that first, it's a weird, like, sound effect. I think it's a guitar or something with a keyboard. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. The thing that threw me off was, was the Ice Cube feature. That was a little... Uh, out there for me i was like huh also this album this album is older than me so like that was the other thing thinking about it was like huh that's this is what metal sounded like before i was born i don't know i thought that that was really cool um and i think my favorite song on the album was uh, dead bodies everywhere that that was a really really uh lyrically interesting song and the thing with a lot of metal is you don't understand the lyrics as much because they're screaming at you but this one i didn't think was was like that i really enjoyed this album i'm not sure i would listen to the whole thing down again but definitely would add one or two of these songs to my playlist 3.8 out of 5 very very specific i love that what was the album's title i, I left it up to you to say spencer because i forgot to write it uh, down the album title is follow the leader by corn follow the leader very cool album cover yeah i can't even remember what it looks like now i haven't got spotify up the album cover looks like it's simba at the top of pride rock oh that's right yes and there's lightning yes Yes. Yeah, well, I, that look, that was a guess because every fucking metal album has lightning on the cover. So it was really a 50-50 chance. Yeah, no, I remember it now. Um, I wanted to mention Justin. Oh, I hate that guy. Because lyrically, it's fuck all that bullshit and, you know, something about space and you're all going to die. It, it's one of those songs that, like, makes you want a headbang. And if I had hair to headbang, this would definitely be a, a song to do that to. Well, when you get to my age, Spencer, you're not doing too much headbanging. It's more of a upper body moving forward like this. I was just going to make a joke, but we can't put it in the episode. Why? I was just going to say you look like an Orthodox Jew when you're doing that. Oh, thank you. That, that's not horrible. It's not offensive. You are Jewish. People need to get over this. Like, you can laugh at yourselves, you know, society. I hadn't actually heard Corn before. I had heard of them, I think, because I, I, I think I follow their drummer on Instagram or something. Much harder metal than, than I think we'd listened to on the show so far, or, and I had had any experience with. It was very much that, like, 
what in my head was like stereotypical, ah, head banging, like hard hitting metal. I had heard German death metal and Swedish death metal and German death metal. You just said German twice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting to to talk about different types of like odd hard hitting music. Yeah, like for example, like free jazz by Arnett Coleman, which is a free jazz record, is like crazy hard hitting, but just like in a very different way. That like that's kind of the vibe. Was it? Yeah, I'm not sure I I enjoyed the lyrics of really any of them. Yeah? The, the lyrics were very aggressive. Well, yeah, look, I remembered Got the Life and Freak on a Leash. So they were the two ones that I remembered, but the rest of the album I didn't know. When I sent it off, it was naively, it was completely innocently, and I had no idea there was so many... Well, I, look, I don't mind the word F-A-G word, because I am gay, and I'm a little bit older than Spencer's generation, so we use that term. There was words like that being said by Fred Durst in there, though who's not gay. So I sort of thought, oh no, I'm going to offend. Yeah, so I could understand it, it, Spencer if it offended you. Funnily, if it didn't offend me, like the, the homophobic language that was in it. So, and I liked that Ice Cube one. I thought that was a lot better than that Fred Durst one, which was just a battle track. It was just like- Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it wasn't bad. It just like came out of nowhere. Okay, yeah. Like I was listening to a metal album and there's like, Oh, it's Ice Cube. Like, that was kind of random. You know, I don't know that there is, like, such an ocean between metal and hip-hop, though. Because, like, for a lot of people, for a lot of the music, a lot of the artists, you know, they have that kind of, like, same energy, mm-hmm. that um, counterculture energy that, you know, it, it's very front-footed. A lot of the beats are quite similar. You know, they, they come in uh, sometimes against the establishment. And especially in that time when there was, like, a huge kind of idea of collaboration as well. Yeah, I mean, last week we we talked about uh, we covered we covered body count um, with that very very much that amalgamation of hip hop and metal, um, but it was it was done in a very tasteful way, which which I enjoyed for sure. Yeah, and they're known for collaborating a lot too. Even just think of at the what was it, the MTV Video Music Awards, Eminem and Elton John. Mm -hmm. Like, that came out of nowhere. I was going to bring up that new Elton John song that he did with Dua Lipa that was kind of like, huh, this is an interesting collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and, like, Madonna will literally collaborate with anybody, so, which is great. I'm I'm not not dissing that at all. I'm just saying that. No, you know, I guess it's, yeah, is is why she's so enduring as well, you know, is that the fact that she's not just, like, sticking to her own, her own style, which she invented so, ever so many years ago, but she's this, you know, she always was the kind of person that would either reinvent herself or certainly keep her ear to the ground and know what the zeitgeist is and tap into that. Exactly. Exactly, and so she's willing to, you know, work with younger performers, which a lot of older performers are not in that industry because of ego. And anyways, um, so have you heard Corn before at all? I have, yeah. I'm like trying to like think, you know, I'm, I'm literally kind of, because I'm old and I never remember anything. So you're not <laughs> <I'm> old. Like, <laughs> sorry, you're not. Trust my dad's eighty-one. Yeah, he's old. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you know, I'm I'm like older than everybody that I work with. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, you know, I mean, corn's massive. They're like major. So it's it's not like, you know, they're not like some obscure. So they definitely would have come across my radar at one point or another. Again, you, you kind of always have to love the front footed guitars of, of everything that they do. It's just like, you know, it's like it feels like like. Like, like if your skin's gonna come off of you, you know, that <laughs> kind of like trying to like push forward. Dirty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, ugh. so yeah, they've 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 been a part of of culture, and so you, you can't really get away from it. No, no you can't. Actually, I said that to Chelsea. I said I I picked this. I picked corn because there's a fifty fifty chance that they have come across you at some point. Hopefully. It turns out they have for me. I I knew two of the songs. You know, there was that chance that they had. So pat on the back to me for that one. But funnily enough, this was not the first album we've covered on this show that had a fart in it. Because there was that talking track where someone farts and there's like, what was that? It was a toot, man. 
I could just do it on cue. And I was like, what the hell am I? Like, I'd expect that from punk, but then metal isn't that far apart from <laughs> punk. But yeah, so we have, we did The Lion King, obviously, with Timon and Pumbaa, the, you know, um, Pumbaa's gassy. Uh, we haven't done Shrek yet, which has a lot of <laughs> farting in that one. Uh, I believe there's burps in that one more than farts. And burps. Yeah, okay, so I knew these basically from parties and they would come on and us punks would take over and turn off the metal and put punk on. So that's really where I knew Got the Life and Freak on a Leash. That's how far we let an album get through before we commandeered (laughs) the stereo because that's what punks did. Well, that's what we did anyways. Yeah, so other than that, like I, I enjoyed it. And I think because of that dirty sound that I didn't, I wasn't, well, I, I guess it's also my tough skin that I wasn't offended by the lyrical content in it. But it matched, you know, because even in, in rap, there is a lot of very controversial things that they're saying to all different communities. So you add that with the music, with the style, and then the emotion that they're putting in there, which is the, the big connection here is there's you know as you say against the the establishment a lot of anger and and in punk as well which is short songs about the disillusion you know and these are a little bit longer um and a little bit darker but yeah no i i didn't mind it what i don't know if i would listen to it again although got the life got stuck in my head mm. so i wish i'd gotten the death but that's another matter um and freak on a leash is my porn name Anyways, we're going to move on very, very quickly. It looks like we can shuck corn and go to an ad break. G'day listeners, Aaron here. We thought we'd better send a spy to Broadway to check out the shows for us. So here for today's review is our Broadway spy, Spencer. This week, I'm reviewing Anne Juliet, of course. Anne Juliet is the most fun I've ever had in a theatre. I've said it. There it is. The cast is incredible. We have Lorna Courtney, Betsy Wolf, and Stark Sands leading this cast with an unmatched joy and talent for the ages. And you have Melanie LeBerry, Paul Ozott, Justin David Sullivan, Philip Arroyo, and Ben Jackson Walker having the time of their lives telling this story. The new arrangements and orchestrations by the amazingly talented Bill Sherman reinvigorate this music while still keeping it recognizable. The book by David West Reed is extremely funny while still being heartfelt. Again, I reiterate, this book is extremely funny, one of the best I've seen on Broadway, with choreography by Jennifer Weber that makes you want to get up out of your seat and dance. The direction by Luke Shepard is familiar, yet fresh. Now, is this show for tourists or purists? What's interesting about this show is that normally, since it's a jukebox musical, I'd say it's for tourists. But something about this show has united those theater fans with the tourists to embrace the show as just the most fun night you can have on Broadway right now. I'll be back to see this one many, many times for sure. And that was Anne Juliet. All right, you're listening to Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Spencer, the Broadway spy, and we are joined by White Snake opening act, Melanie LaBarry. Goodness me. I'll tell you what, I'd, please don't be offended, but I so badly want to say your name in French, Melanie LaBarry, because it just, it sounds so beautiful. I don't know why. Well, I guess everything sounds beautiful in French, so I don't know why. Um, but yeah, all week, that's, yeah, I can't help myself. So very lucky in that introduction that I didn't suddenly break out in a real over-the-top French accent at the end of that. We're very lucky. Now, as you mentioned before, you're from Trinidad and Tobago. Now, is there much of a community theatre or youth theatre down there or theatre programs? There is in that, you know, there are people who run youth theatres and all of that. And I wasn't a part of that. I didn't do theatre as a child. In fact, the one and only drama club that I went to at my school, at my high school. So I was like a teenager. I was told that I was a terrible actor and that this wasn't for me. And I should really just find some other extracurricular thing to do. And look at you now on this show. Goodness me. No, on, on Broadway for crying out loud. Well, I mean, you know, and, and the thing about this is that I don't think that they were wrong because I was probably terrible at the time, having never had any acting lessons or yep. any instruction or or even not knowing really what was required of me. So I was probably, yeah, really terrible. Yep. I was a teenager um, I, and, you know, probably not a natural at it. Uh, I honed every bit of drama skill uh, that 
I have on stage in front of audiences because I went to open auditions and, you know, decided to give it a go. And that's how I did it. So, yes, there are commun- there is community theater. There is youth theater. Uh, it's just I wasn't a part of I didn't I wasn't part of the socioeconomic bracket that took part of in that sort of culture. Oh, excellent. Let's see, uh, we're going to move on to the musical and this time we did Ragtime and I reviewed it because I didn't actually know it. So I'd heard of it and it had been done in Australia once, 2019, in a concert version and I'm not really a fan of concert versions because I want a set. I don't want to see the orchestra going like this the whole time. It's very distracting, especially if there's a drummer and he's got really hot arms. So when I first decided to rip into Ragtime, it was due to our extra special guest tweet about how much she loves it. But it wasn't until it was finalized that I realized, shit, what if I don't like it? Then I'm going to look like a total dick until I realized it's too late for that. I've sent it off. So I dropped the needle on the spotifigram and noticed the cover slash poster was instantly seeping through my speakers with its bright-eyed apple bottom sense of American hope that Lady Liberty herself is seeping with. And only minutes later did I realize that Ragtime is actually about what I originally thought Come From Away would be about, immigrants in New York City. And Ragtime I'd always presumed was about musicians in turn-of-the-century America for some reason. Oh, how wrong I was about that. And oh, how wrong it was to kill off Audra before Interval. One star. No, really, she is one star you don't write off in Act One. Anyways, but hurt aside, I found an almost haunting naivete lingering through this stunning Arens and Flaherty favourite, which no doubt lingers in the characters before things take a dramatic turn. And it's that through line which certainly makes this beloved show their most complete and accomplished work, gifting the performers with emotionally resonant moments to showcase the genius talent on page and on stage. At first, the blending of fictional characters with real-life figures confused me a little. Apart from Emma Goldman, she made sense, but reading the plot on Wikipedia clarified the few unclear moments of this comprehensive album, which takes the listener on a complete journey with these ultimately naively ideal fictional characters who do feel a little bit like they've been drawn from the stereotyped tombola, then glossed over with a splash of perfection and a leap of idealism, which is the only downfall and is the downfall of many musicals. Characters formed to fit the story, not the other way around. But still, stunning score. I give it four stars. Breathtaking. Yeah, so you had performed in this. Yes, it was my West End debut and there's no record of it because I joined the cast midway through the run and had to learn the entire show in one week uh, to be on stage. Uh, Somebody dropped out. Uh, I think the lead lady couldn't, um, or the, the... young woman playing Sarah couldn't do the show anymore and so the understudy was promoted um, and the swing was on all the time and they asked the swing what she wanted to do and she said that she would prefer to stay um, swinging all the parts and uh, and so they needed somebody to fill an ensemble slot and I had gone in for it originally and didn't get it and so then they called me back in and I went in and I got it and I had I think five days to learn the show Wow. And so I rehearsed in the daytime and watched the show uh, every night. And I think it was the specificity of the music. And actually, I, I I like that point you made about the naivety of the characters or the, the kind of um, the glossy perfection of each character. And yeah. I think that that was the point. You have to remember, this was written quite a while ago. And it was about the ideals. And to make the differences so stark, you have to start from a center point. And you start from a center point of the ideal t- representation of each person in each group. And that way you can uh, highlight the differences. Uh, every person in every group comes with so many different light and shade and nobody's really that different at the end of the day. But because they wanted to write a musical about these differences, they had to idealize these forms so that they could show the differences and then show the connections um, that would make those connections and differences even more stark. And so I really like that you you were able to, um, to point that out. But it remains just a, a beautiful thing for me because it was my Broadway debut and I kind of like, not Broadway, it was my West End debut and I kind of slipped in there inauspiciously and that's kind of like me. I'm not, I'm not splashy. I'm not made, I'm not like a big star. I don't come in, you know, and be like, and everybody knows my name. I just kind of slip in under the radar 
and then suddenly I'm there, and then I never go away. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they make your impact. What I thought was really interesting about it, Ragtime is I was reading about it, and I was I was on uh, the Internet Broadway database, and I was reading all the picks. There were 26 musicians. It was a 26-piece orchestra. And you look today. Um, I was uh, I was looking through my playbill the other night. I just I just saw uh, Nathan Lane and Danny Burstein and Zoe Wanamaker in, in pictures from home, and I was looking through the back of the playbill. And for the new Sweeney Todd revival, it says Sweeney Todd starring Josh Groban and Annalee Ashford featuring a 26-piece orchestra with original orchestrations by Jonathan Tunick. That is right below the billing of two of them. And it just, like, listening to this reminded me of that, like, wonderful orchestral sound. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the score was absolutely lush. Uh, and apologies to Stephen Flaherty. For always deliberately saying his name wrong. I have so much love and respect for the man, really. I do. They've written so many amazing musicals. But I think they've written they've written two, in my opinion, two of the most perfect musicals, Ragtime being one and Once on this Island being the next one. I, I'm speaking like musically. Once on this Island is difficult. It's difficult music that sounds simple. And that's a testament to the genius musicality of these composers and it's just it's it, it really is it's a beautiful beautiful work and you know I, I just I don't know I don't know about peaks and, and and all of that all I know is about the work that people create and when you can create work that can last so endurably in the hearts of one the people who perform it and the people who love it then I think that that's worth something well the other thing that's interesting they also did Susical which flopped on Broadway, but is one of the most performed works in schools and on tour. I love that show. I would love to see it come back to Broadway. Just, you know, directed in a way where they embrace the camp and the cheesiness of it. Yep. I, I loved Rocky. I thought Rocky was great. What I was going to say about Ragtime is one of my favorite parts of a show is an opening number. Ragtime's opening number is probably my favorite song in that show. And I think about think about modern opening numbers that get you into the world. Ragtime gets you into that like American like Ragtime is an American musical. And you listen to that opening number, you listen to that piano, and you're like, I'm in America. And I feel the same way about parades opening number. Like you are like, I am in the American South right now. You know, like that's how it makes you feel. And I feel like one of those things that modern musicals don't have is they don't immediately get you into that world like they they introduce you to the characters first a lot of the time nowadays versus introducing you to that world first like kimberly akimbo introduces you to those characters first with that opening number which is uh skater planet and then is like oh we'll get you into the world later it's just new jersey like i think ragtime is part of an era of musicals that found that world building is very important. And I think that that opening number does yeah. that extremely well. Yeah. And that's why I love Into the Woods, because that's just got such a great opening number, which takes up literally 10% of the show. Yeah. Into the Woods' opening number is one of my favorites. There's another one that's a long lightning thief. The, the opening number, the lightning thief musical is also pretty long, just like Into the Woods. And it, int it gets you into that world, like, right away, um, just like Into the Woods does and just like Ragtime does. And I think that that's something that in a lot of the original musicals now we're not getting because they're, they're finding it important to introduce you to the characters first, which isn't wrong. It's just getting you into that world before they get to know the characters. Like, uh, as I said, in Parade, Leo Frank doesn't show up until after the opening number. Hamilton is a great example. Hamilton doesn't show up in the opening number until the end of it. that first part of that opening number is all world building. And that's something that Ragtime builds extremely well. Did you know it before? I had not listened to Ragtime before. I, I knew of it just like from the, the zeitgeist, I guess. I knew the cast. I knew that it was Audra. I knew it was Brian Stokes Mitchell. But I, I didn't really know the plot of the show or anything about it. I think I had heard some of the melodies because when, when the opening number started, I definitely recognized that. But I, I had no experience with it, which with uh, it was it was a 90s musical. So I, I was kind of surprised by that because I, I, I know a lot of the, the more popular musicals from the 90s. 
Um, and I guess this was just one of them that, that I, I missed out on. And it ran for quite a while, too. You know, I, I'm a big fan of looking at the statistics. And this one was definitely an interesting one. They're doing the the reunion concert with the original cast. And it, it was interesting. I had just recently learned about Parade for the first time. And that's a musical that's like based in America. And it's like an American musical. And, and Ragtime very much reminded me of that vibe of like, this is an American musical that has like historical figures. It's like Assassins and Parade and other ones I can't think of right now that are just like, these are historical figures. And it, it's really, I really like that genre of musical where it's about historical figures. I don't know. I, I, the score is just so beautiful. I mean, as I, as I just said, that, that orchestra is just amazing. I, I love the sound of a full orchestra, and um, I would like to definitely explore the show more. Um, yeah, the, ca- the characters are very interesting. It's a long show. I, I'd be interested to see to see either a recording of it or the the archive recording, just to see if it still holds up. It very much gave me that, like, American... Like, I I had mentioned Assassins in there, too. Like, it gave me that, like, old-timey American. I don't know why I keep bringing up Parade. It's because I was at a Parade thing tonight. But it very much reminded me of that, that, like, classic American sound. Yeah, Yeah, I can say that. I did mention that in my review, that Apple Bottom Americana. 100%. In terms of doing this, so you played Sarah... No, no, I was in the ensemble, and I covered, I covered Sarah's uh, friend. In the ensemble, um, okay. So I, I just that, and you know, uh, I didn't know really much about the West End, and and didn't, I didn't even know that it was like a thing. I didn't know that I was doing a thing, like, <laughs> and I was going into the West End. I, I was just like, this is another show that I'm doing. Um, and before that, I was, you know, I'd, I'd play principal parts and whatnot. So it really didn't, you know, it didn't occur to me that. I was doing anything. I was just working. Um, uh, but, you know, then it's only like about a decade later, I thought, oh, my gosh, that was my West End debut. Because people talk about debuts in the, in the age of social media. Now, everything is documented and written down. And, you know, um, and we I didn't have that back then. I didn't even take a picture. I didn't take a picture with a camera, you know. Um, so so I, um, yeah, it's only, it only then occurred to me when people are talking about their debuts. I was like, oh, gosh, what was my debut? I was like, oh, my God. It was rock time. And I had a great, great time. And it was a beautiful production directed by Stafford Arima as well at the Piccadilly Theatre, which closed early. We closed early. Um, and uh, it, it was a very sad, very sad thing. It was produced by Sonia Friedman as well. And I remember Sonia come in um, to, to give us the announcement and she was so heartbroken because it was a really beautiful production, a uh, black box production. And the orchestra, well, you could see the orchestra, but they were at the top and at the back of the stage. So you could kind of see them. So you would have probably been distracted by them. Probably, yeah. <laughs> probably, yeah. And I, all over the joint. Paul Dano, movie star, brilliant actor, like multi-Oscar nominee. He played Edgar, the, the little boy, in the Toronto production. Oh, that's so wonderful. I didn't know that. According to Wikipedia, it could be wrong. <laughs> It's Wikipedia. It's probably wrong. Um, but I thought that was a little fun fact about that. Also, Leah Michelle was in the original cast, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah. But I wonder if she'll do the reunion. Ah. Because she is a member of the original cast. It's an original cast reunion. Yeah. And she, she does happen to be quite a name. Maybe they couldn't afford her. That's true, except none of them are getting paid. Uh, but anyways, we're going to move on. Um Where's my segue? Did I, oh no, I didn't. Looks like we can wipe up on ragtime. We'll be back after this. G'day listeners, Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time? Go to www thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time 
and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. After barely three hours of light sleep, Toniston Turnbull slowly opens his eyes, his body feeling heavier than it ever has before. Not from extra weight, from tiredness and stress. Polly sighs in the shadows behind him, the flame of the nearest barbed wire tiki torch tower having died down, but not out, while Toniston napped. Are you awake? Toniston whispers. Oh, how can I sleep in this place? Polly moans, turning onto her side and facing Toniston, who stays on his back, imagining obscure animal-esque shapes in the rusted tin roof above them, shadows faintly formed by the nearest dying torches. We need to work out a way to get out of here, Toniston states the obvious. He whispers, despite the fact the nearest shacks to their own are several metres away, and the occupants presumably asleep, as most prisoners seem to be. How? There's no fence to squeeze through, or even climb, Polly replies, sitting up in bed and then stretching out her sore arms. The hairs stand on end from the slight chill in the air. I don't know, but I think the whole fighting thing is a distraction. You mean, to distract the other prisoners when new ones arrive? No, I, I think that was just bad timing. Didn't you notice? Toniston goes on to explain his theory. That fight happened, everybody gathered around, I didn't see one person who wasn't watching, and then when I vomited, the only gate in this place closed shut. What are you trying to say? I think something happened when everyone's back was turned. Like what? whispers Polly, her voice breaking up in fear. I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. Toniston's brain starts working overtime, but it's strange that nobody seems to want to leave. They seem almost happy. Definitely content. So, when's the next one of those stupid beatdowns? Toniston can't help but think Polly looks tough, almost evil in the shadows as she asks, I don't know, Toniston begins, but both teenagers are distracted by a crumbling noise in the distance. Hopping out of bed, Toniston joins Polly on her own, equally uncomfortable one. Spotting a large, white package hovering close to the cave ceiling, behind it a shadowy figure. The package is lowered down, causing the teenagers themselves to lower as well, hoping not to be spotted by whom, or what, may be operating this obscure crane. Over a long, slow descent, the package is dropped to the ground. Polly keeps her eyes on it, but Toniston looks up immediately, spotting a large black shadow scurry away to God only knows where. Come, he whispers, as he quietly hops off her bed, slipping into his docks with bare feet. Polly follows his lead. Careful to keep watch on all directions, the teenagers swiftly sneak over to the white package, their hearts beating an almost tribal jam in perfect harmony and stopping in their tracks as the sudden realisation of what lies before them sinks in. A woman, seemingly in her early twenties, wrapped up in bandages from the neck down. No, not bandages. Is that spider web? Polly asks, completely mortified at the prospect. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! Alright, you're listening to Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Spencer the Broadway Spy, and we are joined by former TLC opening act, Melanie LaBarry, and former radio DJ. Had absolutely no idea about that. Now... Before, I've got just a few questions here, but I'll let Spencer go first because he has seen And Juliet, as his nerdy t-shirt says. He claims that he accidentally put it on today. I did. Accidentally put it on, on the day that we're interviewing. We all believe it. <laughs> um, so I love the show. I saw it once in November. Every day since have been dying to see it again. Um, it's just, it's so much fun. Like, that's the main thing. It is pure fun, and it is pure enjoyment. Been a lot of depressing shows on Broadway this season, and so I'm just, I'm really glad that there's 
at least one that's like fun. I think that's a testament. The, the reason when you say that, I think the audience numbers that we've been seeing so far, and especially in this very dark and gloomy January, we've been seeing some some really wonderful audience numbers, and we I thank everybody for coming out and and supporting the show. But I think it's what people need. They need a little bit of fun. They need a little bit of light and confetti and glitter in in these dark days. Yep, especially after that corn album. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> You've done the show in Manchester, then you did it on the West End, then you went to Toronto, and now you're on Broadway. A lot of people who do that always talk about the differences between the audiences. Have you noticed that? What have what have they been the main differences between the, the West End and the Broadway audiences? I, I love that. It's kind of cool to be able to, to take the show to so many different places. One of the things is that David West Reed is a North American writer. He writes great humor and i find that things work very differently here in new york the jokes you know there are jokes everywhere in the show and there are certain jokes that just kind of like rarely pop over here we have amazing actors telling those jokes i mean you can't don't get better than stark sands and betsy wolf you, you know uh to do this material but the writing itself which is extraordinary i find that that works in a very different way here and that's been a testament to the audiences i say this about broadway audiences um what i love about broadway audiences is that they they kind of own you. They own you in a way that, you know, they will take you like this and 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 hold you close to their heart and 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 say, you are ours now. And they will like you when you just appear. Whereas West End audiences, they're not gonna tell you that they like you until <laughs> the very end <laughs> you know you, you have to kind of like prove yourself a little bit more uh to, to certain west end audiences um but broadway audiences kind of they kind of say they re they respect the fact that broadway is quality and they say if you are on broadway we expect you to be quality and therefore we adore you i love that i, I love the love from Broadway audiences. I, it's just is something that I, I feel tremendously every time I step out on stage. Awesome. So what about backstage? Are there any cultural differences in the way that the shows operate? Yeah, I mean, I've had to learn like so, so much. I never thought, you know, I'm, I'm nearly 50, right? And I didn't know that I, I you know, would be like, a baby in, in certain things, you know, like, you know, we have different way that um, different people are in charge of different things. And, you know, we have, you know, people who do certain departments, whereas in, in the West End, we would have one department that would kind of look after all the things or one person that you would go to um, and ask a question. And then they would then filter through to other departments if something needed to be fixed. But here uh, you kind of like, if you need, something about props you, you go to props and if you need something about you know the stage you go to the head of stage and if you need you know so you know the, the you know, even things like the stage manager and the company manager and the the way that they do responsibilities here is so different to the stage manager and the company manager in in london um so you know all of that I'm, like every time i put I, i'm always calling the wrong person Let's just say that every time I you send an email to say, oh, I just wanted to ask you about this. Somebody always has to come back and say, yeah, I'm not the person for that. You have to get in touch with this person. So I just keep getting it wrong. But, you know, hey, you're, not, you're never too old to learn, right? Yeah. And how about the warm up? I'm guessing in London you would do group warm ups. Yeah. Warm ups are mandatory in London. They are voluntary here. They are offered to us and big, big love to our uh, state, to our dance captain and assistant dance captain who take the time and run a warm up for us, uh, for the people who decide to come. It's, it's just a handful of us who go, but I always go because it's part of my culture to warm my body and my voice up and to, to move and sing with members of the company before you get on stage. Yes. I, I can't do the thing where you just, the first time you make a sound or you move in unison is when you see each other on stage. I find that so scary. But I do understand it. You know, if, if you want to use their time, people should be paid. And I understand that, you know, Broadway performers, you know, their activism is at the core of their soul and they know their worth. And if they're not being paid for a certain task, then they're not going to do it. And I absolutely get that. You really shouldn't do what you're not being paid for. One 
warm-up hours are part of our working hours in the West End. So we get paid, it is included in our working week and we get paid for it, it's included in our salary. So I understand that, I, I really, really do. I just, it's just part of what I know, it's part of my working day to come and warm up. So I'll always be there. And Paolo is always yeah. there. So me and Paolo, we jump up together and we sing together before we make it on stage to do Teenage Dream together. So it's really nice. And we get a chance to have a little cuddle and to talk about each other's day. And, you know, so that's nice to be able to connect with Paolo before we make it onto the stage. Yeah. Correction. The correct pronunciation is Dreamboat on this show. I saw him in Avita as Peron. That's all I'm going to say. You lucky thing. I know. He's the sweetest little sweetie pie. <laughs> I got to see him last year as Billy Flynn in Chicago. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, oh, my God, was he incredible. Yeah. Oh, no, we're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about being a dreamboat and being all handsome and stuff. So He is handsome. Yes. Great, great performer, yes. Excellent. Yeah. But he's handsome. But he's also a dreamboat. You can't <laughs> deny it. He's a handsome man. He's a very, very <laughs> handsome man. Yes. <laughs> but Spencer's the straight one here, so... Uh, now, what has been your experience with standing ovations? Oh, look, we never we never expect them, but we've been very lucky that on Anne Juliet we get them. I think it's because they, they're probably up dancing before. <laughs> I don't think it's because of that. They also want to share their joy. This is the kind of show where people will jump up in the middle of the show. You know, they, they've stood up in, in the middle of the show after Raw when Lorna is just being spectacular on that balcony. And I've watched the audience stand up, but you'll give us stand innovation. We hadn't even finished the show yet. It's so lovely to be received like that. It's so lovely to, when you run on stage for your curtain call, which is the first time I ever look at the audience, because I don't look at the audience at all for the entire duration of the show, because I would get frightened. Um, So I just don't look. And so the first time I see them is when I do the curtain call. And it's so nice to just run out there, and open my eyes and see them and, and see that they're all on their feet and just having the time of their lives. Yeah, that's been a, an ongoing discussion on this show um, with, you know, lots of different perspectives. You know, some people... I'm happy for it. Other people are like, no, totally overdone. Sit down, people, and and all that jazz. And I find it fascinating. Well, look, it's far be it from me to judge how individuals want to express themselves at the theater in an appropriate way. Now, if you just go and jump up in the middle of a scene, I'm probably going to decide that you should sit down. But if somebody wants to express their joy and their gratitude by standing up on their feet, I am not going to judge them about it. I'm like, yeah, okay. This is an appropriate time. And that to me is an appropriate response. So on you get. <laughs> yep. I'm here to be the bad cop. So anyways, <laughs> what is the most outrageous thing on your bucket list? Hmm. Most outrageous thing on my bucket list. You know, like ever since I saw Will, right, now, I can't do this because I definitely should should never be touching these animals. And also I'm afraid of the ocean. But ever since I saw Whale Rider, I've wanted to come to New Zealand. And I've wanted to ride a whale. I'm never going to do it. <laughs> but it's like literally my favorite movie in, the, in like the whole world. And um, and I've not been to your part of the world just yet. And so I, I would very much like to come to your part of the world, come to Australia, come to New Zealand and experience the cultures there. Yep. It's not outrageous, but it's just it's just what I would I hope to do in my lifetime. Yep. Now to discern the difference between the two Melbourne neighbors Home and away, Sydney. <laughs> so I know you'll get that. I do. <laughs> Spencer, I have no idea what I am talking about. Uh, anyways, what's one Shakespeare play that you think certainly never, ever, ever needs a sequel? Because obviously we had um one recently that was the sequel to Titus Andronicus or something, or it was a big cleanup or? Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, not. None of those. Yeah, definitely that. That like yeah, it, it, it didn't need one. No. Nah. It's like that that where that ends is where it should end. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we don't need the cleanup, but apparently it was very funny for those who got it. You might know what it was called, Spencer. You know, everything on Broadway. Something something sequel to Titus. <laughs> it was like Dave or something like that, or I think it was Gary. I don't know why but I feel like it was Gary. <laughs> Gary, that's it. That's it. Well, and what's what's interesting too, Aaron, is we, the, in addition to Anne Juliet being a sort of adaptation of Shakespeare, yeah. um, we also have Fat Ham this season, which just won the Pulitzer, which is coming to Broadway, that um, is also a 
play on on Shakespeare. I think it's based on Hamlet. Ah. So so that is a thing that, that happens a lot. Now, see, everyone's saying that Anne Juliet is a sequel, or, you know, a pseudo-sequel, if you will, to Romeo and Juliet. I disagree. It is a sequel to West Side Story because Juliet doesn't die at the end of that. Well, West Side Story is a take on Romeo and Juliet, so... Exactly, and Juliet doesn't die. She survives. She should. Romeo and Juliet are supposed to die at the end of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have a problem with West Side Story. (laughs) They should both die. That's how Romeo and Juliet should end. (laughs) So that's my theory, is that Anne Juliet was originally supposed to be a sequel to West Side Story, and they thought, no, because Sondheim was still alive at the time, and he'll sue. So they went with the original source. Romeo and Juliet. So I, if the creatives out there, please don't sue me. I'm half kidding. Uh, okay, now what is your personal industry pet peeve? Not not a big common social justice thing, like your personal thing that gets up your goat. Lateness. Lateness, yeah. I think lateness is like the ultimate disrespect to other people's time. And I remember I was doing a show where I often had to wait for an actor that I was playing opposite. And I just thought it was, you know, it's like that person didn't respect me. They didn't respect the fact that I was spending my time, that I was, you know, I had gotten dressed and and left home early and got there on time and and was waiting for them. And and yeah, I, I just find this lateness is just like, why, why, why do you think? that you're that important that everybody should wait for you or that we should wait for your disorganization. It's like, get your shit together, basically. <laughs> now, but saying that, how does that go with New York traffic? I don't know. I, I get myself, I've managed to get myself to work on time. So. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> a little bit more serious this time. Uh, Spencer and I were talking recently about um, a certain show that's on at the moment, but just shows in general that may not be offensive in their context or in their text or in their intention, but can possibly be done, directed in a way that can be insulting or maybe miss the mark. Have you ever been in the audience of a production that you were sitting there going, whoa, this just missed the mark in the ugliest way possible? Because I know I have. Uh, I haven't. You haven't? Oh, you're lucky. I haven't. (laughs) I, I, uh, I... Often I'm busy, and so I don't get to see a lot of theatre. I've been very fortunate, touch wood, uh, to be busy. You know, and it's, I'm, I'm often moving from sh- in the West End. I don't know what's going to happen in New York now. But in the West End, I'm often moving from show to show. Or in London, I'm often moving from show to show. So if I'm, I've am left a show and I, on a Saturday night and I start rehearsal for another show on a Monday, and so the last thing I want to do in the rehearsal period is go to the theatre because I'm tired. Oh, that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. um, I, and so when I do go to the theatre, I am very discerning. And I want to go and see things that I know that I will enjoy. I often go to see things that my friends are in. Uh, So I go to support them. And I know that they pick good work because they have excellent taste. Uh, So I haven't. I've been to things that have been just not, you know, just just not good. Boring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Just I've been to like stuff that's been boring. And I'm like, I'm going to leave because life is short (laughs) to (laughs) win. So I've done that like I think once in my lifetime I've left at the interval because I just went I know how this ends because it was an adaptation of a book which I had read so I know how it ends this is really quite terribly boring nothing offensive about it all you know the performers are fine and but it was a boring play and I thought you know I'm getting older by the minute and I didn't want to spend (laughs) any more time in that dark space so I've left for that reason but no I haven't seen anything. I've seen two Broadway shows, you know, since I've been here. Because, again, we've been just been working. So I saw MJ, mm-hmm. which I absolutely adored. And don't fight me because I just I just had the time of my life and those performers are extraordinary. And I saw Strange Loop. Ah, two Michael Jackson musicals. Which was an interesting experience for me because it was a very American show. And I found the language so delicious. And I found myself yeah. wanting to read it. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to read because I, I the language, I just wanted the language to, watch, to wash over me. Yeah. I wanted to be able to sit with it and just be able to go through it at my pace. I felt I, I missed a lot of it because, you know, this very American 
humor. And, you know, and so I was like, oh, I, I really want to be able to understand that. And I feel if I have the script with me, I, I would be able to do that. I will buy, buy it and, and have a read of it. So both of those I enjoyed and I knew that I would enjoy. Well, during Strange Loop, you know, it's interesting. During Strange Loop, I had a real visceral response to when they were going through the gospel section, which is, you know, meant to challenge the audience. Because I had so many friends that died during the AIDS pandemic and people whose hands I held. And, you know, I am from that era. And I wept. I wept uncontrollably. You know, people were like around. And, and I think it was because of the collective experience. It wasn't what they were doing, but it was the, the response of the audience, the laughing and the clapping and, and all of that. And that shot into my heart and broke it into a million pieces. Yeah. So I had that experience. I wasn't offended, yeah. but I did have a real visceral response in the theater to that section of Strange Loop. So, you know, so there's that. Oh, wow. I think actually the art itself should bring up some sort of visceral reaction, whether positive or negative which is something that's kind of lost on audiences today, that everyone sort of feels like it has to give you a positive emotion or reaction, that if you're triggered by something that you can't watch it, that it's a negative thing. And that's not what art is. That's not what it's for. That's not what it's meant to do. So, yeah, I think that's quite amazing. And actually brings up my next question, which is about diplomacy, an ongoing question on this show. How important is diplomacy to you in your career and with your friends? Uh, yeah, it's a good word. I yeah. think I'm trying to think of another word for it. I, I do think it is important. I think it's about, um, you know, people have this thing where they say, you know, I'm just, I say it like it is and I'm just who I am. That's just the way that I am. And I'm like, why you have to? do you have to do you have to like you know I think we have choice we have choice about how we make other people feel and they, they say in it like it is culture I think is is a cop-out I think it's a it's a it's a cop-out to just be mean and I don't think it's necessary I I don't think I don't think we should have meanness in our life you can be honest and you can tell somebody bad news or give somebody criticism or enter into a debate or discourse without being a dickhead, you could definitely do that. So I think that diplomacy is important, but I I just think it's honesty with heart. That's what I think is more important. That's a really beautiful way of putting it. So yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, but then there's the way also diplomacy turns into ghosting or ignoring people because people think it's easier not to say anything than it is to say no. No. But that's just that's just as hurtful. Yeah. Because you're disregarding the presence of those people. And that's just as painful. So again, it goes back to what it is I'm saying is that if we can be honest, but with with kindness, uh, if we can, uh, look, we have in Trinidad, we have this thing called Pekong, right? And Pekong is the way that you make jokes about somebody, you can literally insult somebody, but it's a joke. And we do it all the time. We do it all the time in backstage at Anne Juliet. We're literally just ripping the shit out of each other on a on on a good day. I mean, I I will tell this story. I love this story so much because often I because because I don't think of myself as a great singer. Um, and so if I have about seventy five percent voice, I will still do the show. Because I'm like, I can make it through my songs. Also, to me, it's about storytelling. It's about how you tell the story. And it is not, they, they have singers, but, you know, like people come in to hear Betty Wolf and Lorna Courtney sing. They're not coming to hear me sing. But I could still do the show. And I remember one time my voice was particularly bad. Uh, it was the last day of Toronto. It like literally just was on its way out. And one of the, the young men at the show we were talking about people who hadn't called out and I didn't call out in Toronto. Um, and uh, one of the other guys who didn't call out, he said, he said, oh, Mel, but you didn't call out either. And what the guy said, yeah, Mel didn't call out, but her voice sure did. And we laughed and laughed and laughed because it's true. The voice said, bye-bye and left. But I stayed there and I told the story and it's okay. Now this young man knows I'm twice his age, but he knows that he could say that to me. You know, because it's said with love, it's true. It's not, he's not lying on me. It's absolutely true. And he knows that I'm not going to be offended by the fact that it did happen. And I literally croaked my way through the show in front of 2,000 people in Canada. But such is life. Who cares? You know, I'm lived. <laughs> 
I lived and now I'm on Broadway. Who cares? You know, so so that sort of thing, we have that. And you can have that. You, you, can, you could be sassy and you could give a little dig and rip this shit out of somebody. But if you want to say something that is important, are you going to rip that person to shreds just because that's the way you are? I don't yeah. think so. Exactly. No, I, I 100% agree there. And uh, now that's it from my questions, because we'll, we'll let you guys. Spencer, have you got anything else quickly? So you said that you've only seen two Broadway shows. If you had a free night, uh, what, what would be next on your list? If I had a free night and could go back in time, I would have loved to have gone and seen my sister Sharon in Death of a Salesman because I love that woman with my entire heart. We have worked together a few times and she's extraordinary. And I would have loved to go and see her and Wendell Pierce make great magic on the stage. I love plays. I I, re, I love plays. I, I love Death of a Salesman. I, I saw a great production with Brian Dennehy uh, back oh, wow. in London. Uh, some time ago um and so yeah that that's where i would have liked to go oh wonderful if you go back on time would you say yes to coming on this show yes of course <laughs> oh lovely i got to see sharon in carolina change and death yep. of the salesman um and just the, the differences in those two performances and how, how drastically different they were from each other just incredible well i've never seen Sharon Clark in anything because I am stuck in Melbourne. So, Aaron, you need to come visit. If people would listen to this show and help us get advertisers, then I can maybe afford to go see a Broadway show. I can maybe afford to go see a show in Melbourne. That'd be good too. PR companies call me. Anyways, that's it from us. Uh, where can people find you on the social medias? They can find me at Melabari, M-E-L-A-B-A-R-R-I-E on all my social medias because I have no imagination. And so they're all the same thing. <laughs> yep. For those at home, don't say it in a French accent. I'm just a nerd. That's all it is. And I can't help myself. But anyways, you have been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so sorry we, we ran over time. It's very lovely meeting you. All right, my darlings. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thanks so much. Looking forward to seeing the show again. And show off your t-shirt, you nerd. <laughs> anyways, that's it from us. You can find Spencer on Twitter at Spencer Sher. S-H-E-R underscore. The underscore comes last, not in the middle. A huge thank you to Melanie for joining us, especially right in the middle of Anne Juliet. So if you're listening to this, go and see Anne Juliet on Broadway or in Melbourne when it opens or anywhere across the world. And if you're in London, it closes on the 25th of March in the West End. So make sure to pick up your tickets as soon as you can. And I'm sure it's going to tour the kingdom after that. So I'm not sure where else it's going to be around the world, but, you know, these songs are so familiar. It's all Max Martin, you know, who wrote some of the biggest songs in history. So you just know it's going to travel the world. And yes, apparently, according to everyone who's seen it, which is not me, it's really, really fun. And a huge thank you to Chelsea for helping me organize today's episode. Doing this show is an absolute roller coaster, especially from Australia. So to get any help from anyone around the world is such an honor and a privilege. And you all help us make this show what it is. But anyways, to you at home, you take care and we shall see you next time. Uru. Take care, guys. Thanks so much. Like, like,